The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark. Glory, Glory to you, Lord, Lord Christ. As Jesus taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in small, two small copper coins, which were worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words that I will say and the words that you will hear be in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated, dear friends. Well, good morning to you all. It's great to see you. Uh, great to see you all. A little bit of the backstory. About two weeks uh, ago, I got a text from our good rector, Pastor Charlie, and uh, he offered me an opportunity. Uh, to preach, and he gave me two dates, November 10th or November 17th. Uh, and, um, and as soon as I read the text, I, um, I knew I immediately wanted to accept the invitation, but I, and I also knew I did not want to preach on November 10th, which is today. And you're saying, well, why is that? Well, it was the Sunday after the election. And having been a, uh, a priest in the Episcopal Church forever and a day, um, you know, I just looked at my own life and, you know, half the time the candidate who I supported would win and half the time the candidate I supported would lose. And, um, and I noticed that was always the case in my congregation. So some people would be coming in on a cloud, uh, and some people would, uh, would not be uh, coming in on, uh, on a cloud at, at all. And I said, oh gosh, it's, I said, it's gonna be just, uh, I don't know if I wanna deal with, uh, with all of that. But hopefully picking up a little wisdom over uh, many years of life, I turned 70, by the way, in just a couple weeks, I, uh, I said, maybe I should actually read the readings first. Do you, do you follow? That, that might be helpful to sort of see if there was something that jived. And um, well, truth be told, I never even made it to the readings on November 17th, because uh, most of the readings I was very, very familiar with. Uh, the epistle, and the gospel, and quite honestly, even the, the psalm. But the Old Testament reading that was uh, read today was one that was, and this is a surprise to people in the pews, the priests sometimes do have um, areas of, oh, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, gaps uh, that, the book of Ruth, maybe many of you are experts on the book of Ruth, but I knew very little about the book of Ruth. On top of it, I read the reading that you have and I went, oh my goodness, this sounds salacious. So it does, let's be honest. Uh, uh, it, 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 it does sound uh, salacious. I said, well, I said, I, I'm going to get familiar with the book of Ruth, you know, here, I, I've got an R-rated uh, uh, thing, you know, lesson here that I'm not really familiar with. So, um, so I want to do two things uh, today. I want to uh, give a brief little teaching um, on Ruth, and um, I would also, uh, quite honestly, like to preach to you because after I read the book of Ruth, the first thing I thought of, I says, oh my gosh, it's a Hallmark movie. 
it's a Hallmark movie. Um, and uh, and it, it, it was, there was, it was kind of romantic and this isn't the sort of thing, you know, I'm used to dealing with, quite frankly. And uh, so um, let me begin first with the topic, which is if, uh, on, uh, on hope itself. Now, what is hope within the Christian context? As followers of the Christ, when you hear the word hope, um, what is the foundational teaching as a Christian on hope? Now, hope is a theological virtue, a theological virtue. And there are three, only three, three theological virtues. The first is faith. And I'd like to tell you that hope uh, is related very closely, I call it fraternal twin, um, to faith. The second virtue is hope, and the third is love, sometimes translated charity in some of the older, um, like the King James would have translated uh, that as charity, giving you some idea of the kind of love uh, that uh, that we're, we are speaking of. Now, a theological virtue, when you hear like theology, at first, you know, you glaze over or something, but they're nothing more than guide ra rails for you as you're learning, uh, uh, you know, to kind of keep you kind of on the path uh, and, um, and not going off the reservation, uh, so to speak. Um, so it's, it can be very helpful. Um, now, first and foremost, I have to say to you, Christian hope differs from worldly hope. Worldly hope can be sign of kinds of wishful thinking. Um, we all do that at times, and uh, that's understandable. But Christian hope is our hope in God, our hope in God through his son, Jesus Christ, okay, who gives us an image of what God is is like. Um, the other thing I would share with you about Christian hope is it's not really something you do. It's something you receive. It is something you receive. It is a gift. It is a gift of grace. God has sent unto us his only begotten son. Oh, and, um, and that is a great gift. Um, but what I want to argue uh, to you uh, this morning is that you have to actually receive the gift. Not all people receive this gift, but that gift is uh, available uh, to you for those of you who say yes. And <clears throat> so I would like to, um, uh, again, share with you the relationship between faith and hope. The actual definition of faith in the scriptures comes from the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, the very first verse. Faith is, okay, I mean, it makes it black and white. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Okay, that's what faith is, the assurance of things hoped for. Okay, so, you know, you hear this in... Uh, the uh, 13th uh, chapter of the 1st Corinthians. We're all familiar with this. Faith, hope, love. These three abide. And the greatest of these is love. Thank you. This is a test. There are going to be many tests here. Okay. Uh, and, and the greatest of these is love. So we all, you know... Charlie does a fabulous job, God bless you, on preaching about love. And goodness knows we talk about faith all the time. But what is ignored, uh, quite honestly, one of the big three, uh, oftentimes, even within the Christian family, is hope. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, if you think of, um, think of Dante's great uh, poem, uh, the inferno, you know, and 
in that opening line, oh, isn't this beautiful poetry? Um, Midway through the journey of my life, I found myself in a dark wood, for the right path had been lost. He had gone off the path, and uh, the only way forward for him was uh, basically going through the inferno, going through hell. Uh, and do you, any of you remember as he enters uh, into there, there's a sign uh, before uh, that he enters, when he enters hell? Any of you remember what that sign says? Abandon all hope. There's a Harvard graduate there for you. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, ab abandon all hope, ye who enter. Okay? So, um, again, I'll, I'll say unto you, if, you, if you do not have hope, if you lose your hope, you are unwittingly losing your faith. And not only that, when you lose your hope, you are going through hell, okay? And so I'd like to try to be an advocate for us um, strengthening and invigorating our hope uh, quickly uh, this morning. Now, I told you that hope within the Christian context is um, hope in God through his son, Jesus Christ. And that is absolutely true. But the song you sang today, um, <clears throat> uh, Lord of all hopefulness, that I found when I accepted Jesus Christ and said yes, that gift that uh, was given me, when I finally said uh, yes to that, I felt such hope in my life that it colored my life, how I looked at life. Do you follow, Eve? Not just when I was in church or doing Jesus work, uh, but everything I looked at looked brighter, and uh, life was given meaning and given purpose. So I do want to share two things here that I think are very practical and very helpful. And um, this is how I base my sermons, that I want you to leave here and say, you know, I got a little something out of that. Um, now, the first thing I would tell you is one of the persons who studied religion in all its formats was a gentleman by the name of William James. Now, <clears throat> William James was the father of American psychology. Uh, and he's a bit of a hero uh, of mine, much loved by religious people and quite frankly admired by unreligious people. Uh, Sigmund Freud put him up on a pedestal, quite frankly, and rightly so. Uh, he was the most famous teacher for uh, nearly uh, a quarter of a century at Harvard, uh, where, he, where he taught. And he was an advocate of people who illuminated and lived their life out of hope. But he believed, and I think he's got some points here uh, that I would share with you, he believed that one of the essential elements of being a hopeful person is a willingness to take action. A willingness to take action, okay? In other words, you, you just can't go, uh, you, you know, into a shell uh, and cut yourself off. You really have to, uh, to take action. And I think that there's a biblical um, mandate for this, and it's found... Uh, in the book of James, um, now James was Jesus' half-brother. Mary went on to have other children uh, with Joseph. And um, James wrote, uh, Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Okay, so you, you have to recognize that, um, you know, just saying, you know, uh, just living in your own little private Idaho, so to speak, you know, your own little world, um, that's not uh, really what faith and hope is all about. It's about you blessing others uh, as you have been blessed through your faith in Christ. 
So I, I wanted to share that. Now, uh, quickly, the book of Ruth is, you know, if you're ever looking for a, uh, a book to say, you know, I think uh, that big tall guy at uh, Grace Church, uh, he, uh, you know, he was, he was pretty enamored with that book. Maybe I should pick it up. Let me, uh, let me see if I can sell this to you, okay? <laughs> um, first of all, it's short, okay? So you're not with chapter 37, verse 58. This is four verse, excuse me, four chapters long. You know, you're in and out in 20 minutes, 25 minutes, okay? So, and it moves along and it's got a marvelous reputation uh, uh, as kind of a masterpiece of Hebrew literature. It is really highly thought of and is read at the Festival of Weeks um, uh, every year uh, in the Jewish uh, tradition. So first of all, keep, uh, uh, keep that in mind. Um, uh, secondly, if you think about it, there are 66 books in the Bible, right? 66 books in the Bible. And many, many, many of them are named after men. Oh, it's true. There are only two books in the Holy Bible that are named after women. Esther, which I am familiar with, and Ruth. Um, now, and, and so first of all, that's kind of intriguing, you know, if you'd like to say, okay, you know, this is interesting. Uh, the, the other thing is the primarily the characters revolve around three characters, okay? Naomi, who is Ruth's mother-in-law, and she is just a splendid individual, a really good soul. She would be in her 70s, um, when all of this, most of the action is taking place. Um, and of course, Ruth, Ruth would be about 40 years of age at the time uh, that you hear this. Um, and uh, the third person is Boaz. Now Boaz is known as almost a Christ-like figure, uh, a redeemer, that's what he's called, uh, a redeemer. Uh, and that was the expression that was used. Um, so, so these, and every single one of these people is nicer than the next, okay? So you're dealing with three nice people, okay? Um, and it's kind of nice to deal with, oh my gosh, this, these, are, these are just nice people. And so without getting too far into the story, um, and plus, the action takes place. All this that's going on that you heard today, which the rest, what you had is nothing more than four verses from the third chapter, and uh, they, they uh, grafted it to four verses in the uh, fourth chapter. And uh, so you're missing 99% of all the action, the suspense, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. But the three characters, those three, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. Well, a character who's not a main character uh, that begins, uh, oh, and I wanted to say it takes place in Bethlehem. Isn't that marvelous? It's the very birthplace of King David, the very birthplace of Jesus Christ. So this story is taking place in uh, the little town of Bethlehem. Now, <clears throat> The story starts out uh, in uh, Bethlehem, in uh, Judea, not too far from uh, Jerusalem. And there is a famine in, um, uh, in Judea. And uh, Emelech is married at that time to Naomi. They have two sons, but Emelech, he says, you know, if we're gonna stay here, you know, in Judea, uh, we're, we could very well die. You know, we're going to lose the boys. We're, you know, we have got to immigrate. And so they become refugees. They, he, he takes his family, Emelech, and he travels to the land of Moab. Now, Moab happens to be 
east of the Dead Sea. It's considered kind of a cousin um, of Israel in some ways, but they really didn't get along well because the people in Moab did not worship Yahweh. They did not worship the God of Israel. So, um, but nonetheless, as refugees, they go there, they survive. It sounds like they thrive, but <clears throat> uh, both of their boys, uh, Naomi's children, marry local women from Moab. Uh, and those two women are Ruth and Oprah. And within the course of 10 years, Amalek dies, and then both boys die. They don't talk about how they died. That's not the point of the story. But it happens. People die. We know that all too well. Good people. Uh, and, and so this is a real predicament. I'm taking you back, you know, many, many generations before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I have to let you know, if you were a woman and you did not have a husband, a son, a brother, uh, they tended to be, at, at this time, a provider. Women did not have very many rights at this uh, time. This is, this is unequivocal, uh, just the truth. It was a desperate situation. Uh, not, <clears throat> Naomi's husband is dead. And, uh, and, and both her uh, sons are now dead. And so the only ones left are her daughter-in-laws. Um, and that would be, of course, Ruth and Oprah. And so she's, she cares for them deeply. And she says to them, I think I'm going to return to Bethlehem. I don't know if anybody will take me in. I've got a postage stamp, basically, little plot of land that uh, Emelech, uh, you know, owns that, uh, you know, but other than that, I have nothing uh, to, uh, to, uh, to offer you. I think you should stay here in Moab for your own good. And tearfully, Oprah follows that counsel and, um, and returns uh, to uh, her family in Moab. <clears throat> now, Ruth, Ruth is absolutely devoted to her mother-in-law. And, uh, said, and then it's one of the most beautiful um, verses in the uh, Old Testament uh, that has been read in many, many weddings. And most people think it's a woman talking to her husband. That's what they image up. It's not. It's uh, Ruth talking to her mother-in-law of all people and she says and you've all heard this uh, where you go I will go where you lodge I will lodge your people will be my people and your God will be my God and she the Bible says she clings to Naomi and Naomi of course is completely moved by this and so off they trek back to Bethlehem, completely and utterly destitute. <clears throat> so um, they get to um, they get they get to Bethlehem, and all the men are out harvesting. As you heard, uh, it's the barley harvest, uh, and uh, they make good Israeli beer, I would imagine, uh, from that. Uh, and so they get into the village and all the women gather around and she didn't, Naomi didn't know if people would recognize her. And they said, oh, there's Naomi. Um, and uh, they did recognize her and she said, don't even call me Naomi. Now, Naomi is a realist. She said, the hand of the Lord has been upon me. It's a Hebrew expression, you, you know, that, some, when bad things happen sometimes, you know, one after another after another, the hand of the Lord is, you know, but basically, blessed be the name of the Lord. She never, she never denigrates God uh, in any way, shape, or form, but she's honest. She's in a pretty tough situation. Um, and, um, 
The women, you could tell, really admire Ruth for sticking with her. Ruth doesn't waste any time, said, I'm going to go where the barley harvest is. We need to eat. And now part of the Mosaic law was that when the gleaners uh, went through the harvest, the reapers, if you will, to uh, um, whatever they didn't pick, things get left behind. If you've ever gone apple picking or something, you know that tree could be 90% picked over, but there's always a few left or something. Uh, and uh, so you are allowed to do that. And through uh, faith, uh, providence, however you want to say it, she starts to glean uh, in uh, a field by Boaz. Now, Boaz, of course, this is, like I said, a, a Hallmark movie, is very wealthy. <clears throat> now, and Boaz is, he's an older guy. He's, he's in his 70s, quite frankly. Uh, he's, he's a pretty old guy. And he notices right away. And he goes, who is that way over there? You know? I, I think he, you know, her beauty caught his eye as uh, how Miriam and I have sort of uh, divined this. Uh, but he notices right away. By the way, that's how I met my, uh, my wife. She was walking 75 feet away and she's walking a dog, and I'm in my patio filling up the bird feeder, and I recognize the dog, but I had never seen this woman before. She was, she was taking care of her boss's dog, and, um, you know, so I, you know, I, I said hello to her. She didn't, you know, she's looking, uh, uh, I had to say it a second time, and, you know, I, Bought the dog some, got some, it was a hot August 26th. Uh, brought the dog some water. That was a little side. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Uh, but anyway, I've, but that drew me into the story when this happened because I lived that. That's how I met my wife, um, quite honestly. So it brings you into the story. <clears throat> and so, Boaz, who gets up and takes nice pills, every, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it's just such a great, he goes down, introduces himself to her, uh, and, uh, and she, his, uh, his workers had told him, that's uh, Naomi's daughter-in-law. So he had some information, but he is just so kind to her. He said, um, you know, anytime you need a, any water, go right up to the water jugs. And uh, we're going to have lunch, uh, a meal, uh, at, at lunch, noontime. Come up and have uh, the meal. And don't glean anywhere else. Stay right here. You know? Uh, so, um, and then get this. He actually gathers all his, his uh, reapers. And he said, and he sternly tells them, do it. I don't want any one of you, and this is the exact words that are used, to insult her. Do you follow? Because she's poor. Do you follow? Because she's indigent or whatever. No one insults her. And if she wants to even pick from the first pickings, allow her to do that. So she, at the end of the day, she, uh, well, she has lunch with uh, Boaz, and they connect some more. Again, I'm telling you, it's a romantic story. Um, and... Uh, so they have lunch, and so she goes back with two-thirds of a bushel of a grain, which is like a lot of grain, and it's enough for two people for 10 days. Naomi's like, oh my gosh, where did you get all of this? She said, I have found favor with a man named Boaz. And so Naomi goes, he's a kinsman of ours. Now, at this time in Israel's history, uh, this would not continue, by the way, but you, a uh, brother could um, marry, uh, if he was unmarried, uh, his brother's widow. Uh, and this was to keep the family line going. Uh, and, so, um, and so then you get two women together, and they said, you know, I'm concerned, you heard it this morning, I'm concerned about your security. Uh, this is what I want you to do. 
Now she's 70 years old. She's, she's worldly. She's been around the block, let us say, okay? She, this is what I want you to do. Um, go in your best clothes. Now, when you go threshing, you don't go in your best clothes. You know, I uh, put on the, you know, that one nice outfit you were able to, uh, to bring with you from uh, Moab. Uh, put that on and um, don't make yourself known to Boaz. In other words, be a little bit aloof. You know, don't let him even hardly know you're there. And uh, then this cracked me up. Uh, do not approach him until he has, and some of the versions of the Bible are great, until he has finished being merry, drinking, and eating. You know, do you ever, any of you ladies ever know men, if they haven't eaten, they could be a little hangry? Have you ever heard that? Ever experienced that? Uh, and so uh, she follows right to a T, and then she tells them, you know, uncover his feet. Um, and she says, oh, okay. So when I read this, I, like I said, I thought it was like some hanky-panky here. But actually, when you read it, um, she does that because when your feet aren't covered, you often wake up because uh, you're, you're cold. And that's what she wanted to have happen. And so he wakes up, and he's got this haughty 40-year-old, if you will, Okay, next to him, who's, who's he's somewhat admired, and they have this splendid conversation uh, together. And uh, he tells her, you know, put your cloak over me. It was a, in, believe it or not, this was a way of her actually proposing to him. Uh, no, no, really, that's exactly what's kind of going on. And, um, but he adds more suspense to the story. Uh, he said, I am a kinsman, but there's one kinsman clo who's closer, and it would be scandalous for us uh, unless we give him the first option. Uh, and, um, and then he says, so it's not as scandalous in my opinion. He said, go down by my feet, but make sure you get up uh, before dawn so that nobody will think anything bad happened. And, you know, just um, return... Uh, to where Naomi uh, is. She follows all of this. And uh, the amazing thing is, is that uh, um, she marries Boaz and at, in, at 40 years of age, she, she gives birth to a son. Now that son becomes, Jess, uh, becomes the father of Jesse. As Christians, it's always said between the Christians and the Jews, we are grafted into the root of Jesse. And so Jesse is the father of King David. Joseph, um, the earthly father of our Lord and Savior, um, was from the house of David. So Naomi, Ruth, you know, they become, believe it or not, uh, sort of uh, the mother and gr great-grandmother of kings. Uh, and, um, and so it's a story that it starts out very dark, very gloomy in a way. There's their refugees, their immigrants. Uh, the, Naomi's husband dies. Her, the, the, both boys die. You're thinking, oh my gosh, this is, uh, this is absolutely, uh, absolutely horrible. Um, but it ends up, and, you know, I want to share with you, Pastor Charlie, you always talk to us about movies, you know, and it wouldn't be right to have a preacher here, uh, not in, bring up a movie to you. But uh, so, and this really helped me, by the way. There was a line in a movie, I recommend the movie, because I'm an older guy, and it's a movie kind of about seniors, and it, uh, it's called... The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. Uh, and it's a who's who's list of the best British actors of a certain age. Maggie Smith. Um, it's one after another. Uh, Bill Knightley. Um, Judy Dench. It's one after another. You go, I know this person. I know this. Uh, and they're all older pensioners going to Italy. And then um, Dev, Dev Patel. 
is just delightful in it. Um, he, he tells them, because they're all not happy with the hotel or this, that, or the other thing. Um, and he says to them, you know, in this country, we have a saying, uh, in the end, it's going to be okay. And if it's not okay, it's not the end. With your permission, if I could say that again. Okay, remember, it begins with the end, kind of like Stephen Covey, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, begin with the end in mind. In the end, it's going to be all okay. And if it's not okay, it's not the end. And that sums up, quite frankly, the book of Ruth. So let me close, hallelujah, <laughs> by simply saying the hope is the very bridge you cross over from today to tomorrow, from here to eternity. And when you have the courage to say yes, and you cross that bridge of hope, you are being led by the good shepherd, the very son of God himself, Jesus Christ, okay? And, um, and there's no way you can lose following him. There is no way you can lose. And our only response to that is, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Amen.